This film is lit, the podcast where we finally settle the score on one simple question. Is the book really better than the movie? I'm Brian. I have a film degree, so I watch the movie, but don't read the book. And I'm Katie. I have an English degree, so I do things the right way and read the book before we watch the movie. Look, some of us are lazy, all right? If by lazy you mean wrong. Prepare to be wowed by our expertise and charm as we dissect all of your favorite film adaptations and decide whether the silver screen or the written word did it better. So turn it up, settle in, and get ready for spoilers. Because guess what? This film is lit. film adaptation so ubiquitous, so timeless, everyone has seen it at least once. And even if you haven't, you recognize all the references anyway. It's The Wizard of Oz, and this film is lit. Hello and welcome back to This Film is Lit. On today's episode, we are discussing the 1939 Academy-nominated film... The Wizard of Oz, and the book it is based on by Frank L. Baum. L. Frank Baum? L. Frank Baum. L. Frank Baum. It's a classic. Uh, it's one of the most popular films, if not the most popular film of all time, potentially. Most yeah, viewed of yeah. all time. It's yeah. up there. And it's based on a book. So we're going to break it down. Before we get into our segments and get into Guess Who got some info about the movie for people who don't know some fun facts pretty much everybody has seen this like we said in the intro so i don't need to go too much into the summary of the story i don't think because i think Mm, anybody who hasn't seen it what do you what (laughs) (laughs) where have you been what are you century what are you (laughs) but so it was nominated for six academy awards i think it won two or three it was up for best original song which did win for Somewhere Over the Rainbow, obviously. Oh, yeah, I think it did. Yeah, it did. No, yeah. I know it won for that. It was up for Best Picture. I think it also won for Best Original Music, or uh, some other editing or something mm-hmm. like that. Uh, it was up for Best Picture. Did not win that. Lost two. Do you know? What else came out this year? 1939. Think of gigantic films in cinema history uh, from that era. Citizen Kane? Uh, Citizen Kane, I believe, was earlier. Okay. But um, oh, 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 um, um, um. I think you know. What's the name of that movie? Oh no. Hmm? Oh, I think I know what you're thinking of, uh, but that's Casablanca? not the right. Yeah, I knew that's what you're thinking of. That's Dang not it. it. It's the other one. The other, the other Casablanca. No, Gone with the Wind. Oh, Gone with the Wind. Okay. Same year, 1939. Huh. Hell of a year for movies. <laughs> Apparently. Uh, also, Mr. Smith Goes to Washington came out that year. Was also nominated. But the other fun fact about Gone with the Wind and the Wizard of Oz, mm-hmm. directed by the same guy. Really? We'll talk about a prolific year. <laughs> uh, his name is uh, Victor Fleming. Huh. He directed both The Wizard of Oz and Gone with the Wind, and he won Best Director for Gone with the Wind. He that's, wasn't nominated for Wizard of Oz. That's interesting that he's not more of a household name. It's. I think part of it is back then, with the way the studio system worked, mm-hmm. it wasn't... Because they, they it wasn't so much of like... Nowadays, we have more, like, auteurs. Right. And with the whole auteur theory where the director holds a singular vision, which isn't really even true. Like, there's so much input from other people, and, and movie making is such a combined process. But the idea of uh, the auteur wasn't a thing as much at that point. There were some, like, Fritz Lang is kind of, like, the guy who made Metropolis uh-huh. and uh, M and a, a bunch of other movies, German director, kind of considered an auteur. Hitchcock wasn't. Was a little after this, I think. Yeah, Hitchcock was like 50s, 60s. 50s, yeah. So yeah. he's, a, but he's, he's an auteur. So it wasn't quite thinking, the way the studio process worked, it was a little, it was a little different. And, okay. and the other thing is that The Wizard of Oz was actually, had four directors over the course of it. Oh. <laughs> so it's another thing I want to get into before we, oh, but anyway, this movie had a tumultuous production process. Like, incredibly tumult, like, you, nowadays when you hear like, oh my gosh, uh, Star Wars Rogue One is reshooting half the movie. That happens. That's happened forever. 
And, I mean, The Wizard of Oz, four different directors. It was recast. Uh, The Tin Man was recast because of a a health issue, which we'll talk about. But Mm -hmm. the Tin Man had a violent reaction to the makeup he was in and and almost died. And they had to recast him. Changed directors a bunch of times. It's very interesting. I was reading the Wikipedia page and I was just like, this is fascinating. I'm sure there's a documentary about it. And I actually really want to watch it now because I was like, this is really cool. So, one of the other things this is really known for is the Technicolor, which right. was, it wasn't the first film that used Technicolor, but it's like the first big, it was the picture mm-hmm. that was like Technicolor. And the Technicolor's uh, just a way that they colorize film. Mm-hmm. Uh, before that, a k- kinemagraph or something was the process they used. But Technicolor was interesting because it allowed for a much higher saturation and much more colorful, right. which obviously which for this movie... Yeah. This, and this, this is why it was such a good example of Technicolor, because right, it had that high right. contrast fantasy. Yeah, they, they, use the, they use it to help tell the story. Yes. Other really interesting thing, a couple more fun facts about this movie. I Like I said, I went down a hole of just, this is really interesting. <laughs> it was first broadcast on television in 1956 on CBS as part of like a, a Ford-sponsored like miniseries mm-hmm. thing and it was like the final like there was a judy garland variety hour and like hmm. all kinds of stuff but anyways this was the last thing so it was first broadcast on television in 1956 and this is when everybody saw the movie and they it became such a big thing that they showed it every year it became like mm-hmm. an annual wow. showing of the film and it was the most viewed film in syndicated television history Hmm. currently technically at least according to the wikipedia article also it's one of the one of 10 films that UNESCO, which is the United Nations Education, Science, and Cultural Organization, put on their world register. They have a thing called the Memory of the World program, okay. where they, they it's basically in an international initiative to safeguard the documentation, document humanity, basically, to where if there's like uh, wars and, and uh, climate issues and like if society goes extinct they're like trying to this this organization has tried to collect all of like humanity's giant like preserve our culture. preserve our culture basically huh. and this is one of 10 films that is on in their thing wow uh, a couple other ones that people a lot of them are like short films and like like the very first film like from uh, the lumieres and that sort mm-hmm. of thing but um the other big one, Metropolis, which is a Fritz Lang film, is on there. And then it's a bunch of other foreign films and a couple other... Mm-hmm. But this is one of them. It's one of the only ones. So that's pretty cool. And I think that's all the fun facts I had. Oh, they began production after Snow White because uh, Snow White proved fairy tales right. can make bank. And, so. and they were like, let's do that. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, we could use that to lead into... I have some book fun facts. Oh, all right. Of the Wonderful Wizard of Oz yes. by L. Frank Baum, because they dropped the wonderful in the movie title. Oh, okay. To be concise, I guess. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, although they don't drop it for the songs. The Wonderful Wizard yeah. of Oz. Yeah, that's true. I didn't even think about that. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> um, but Wonderful is in the title for the book. So L. Frank Baum wrote The Wonderful Wizard of Oz with the intention of writing an American fairy tale. Mm-hmm. I can see um, that. He wanted to write something for children that didn't have the same really heavy, obvious moral overtones that were really common in children's literature right. around the turn of the century. German, in other words. Yeah, German. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that's what he did. He did what he set out to do. Um, spoiler alert, it was super popular. Mm-hmm. And he went on to write 13 more books that are set in Oz. Yeah. None of which are as popular no. as The Wizard of Oz. I really enjoyed this book. I have like vague memories of reading it as a kid, but I had forgotten most of it. Yeah. And one of the really interesting things about this is that the movie is so timeless now and so iconic that it's pretty much superseded our cultural memory of the actual story in the book. Yeah, like, no, yeah, completely. We, yeah, we've I mean, got the movie now, and that is the story, and there are very distinct differences. I think a fair amount of people would say that they know. Like, I knew I wasn't, like, like with Princess Bride, I, I was a little surprised when I found out that was a book. Mm-hmm. But, like, with this, I knew this was a book. I, right. You know what I mean? I think no, most people, people know. People it's just know a lot it's of people haven't read it. Yeah, but nobody reads it anymore, because yeah. you can watch the movie. Just watch the movie, yeah. 
But it is, it's it's a children's book, but it's very, it's a very enjoyable read. And a very easy read. Yeah. I read yeah, it so in you like, booked through it like, yeah, over in the like last the weekend. scope of an afternoon. Yeah. You, 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 you <laughs> checked it out and you were like, well, I'm like halfway done with it. I was like, you got it earlier today. <laughs> like, yeah. It, yeah. Um, and get the illustrated version too. Yeah. If you're going to read it, because the illustrations are pretty choice. But the uh, Wizard of Oz came out about a half a century after Alice in Wonderland. Mm -hmm. um, and another interesting thing I found out was that L. Frank Baum actually didn't like Alice all that much. He liked the idea of like a, a young heroine going to like a fantasy world, yeah. but he thought that Lewis Carroll's plot was completely incoherent, not which is not untrue. Wrong. <laughs> not entirely wrong. Um, I, mean, I mean, we'll get to Alice in Wonderland eventually. eventually. Yeah. And I mean, that is kind of the point of Wonderland is yeah. that it's incoherent. Yeah. But this is, uh, The Wonderful Wizard of Oz is very easy to follow. Mm -hmm. It's a journey story. Very, very easy to yeah, follow. Yeah, no, it's very, yeah, very simple. Yeah. I also have tea to spill about... L. Frank Baum. All right. Um, so I was scrolling along, I was reading, and I was looking into his political views. Oh, boy. <laughs> because um, I'll talk about it later, but there's a prevailing political theory about this book. Of so the was, Wizard of Oz? Yes. So I was looking, I was reading about his be. political views. Well, I'll, I'll get there. A vaguely little... liber libertarian, maybe? We'll get there. All Don't right, worry. Right. Um, and I found out. So he was an advocate for women's suffrage. Okay. But he also allegedly called for the wholesale genocide of Native Americans. Nice. <laughs> yeah. So that's fun. <sighs> so he wrote in Jesus. the in the nineteen in the eighteen nineties. He wrote a couple of editorials. Basically arguing in the eighteen nineties. In the eighteen nineties, yeah, he wrote uh, two editorials, basically arguing that the only way for the white man to survive out west was murder all the murder all of the Native, Native Americans. Americans. While it's possible that they were intended as satire or sarcasm, <sighs> it's. Probably not likely. I mean, there are definitely satirical elements of Wizard of Oz yeah. that even come through in the movie. Yeah, to, to an extent. So I, I, I could, but yeah. But <laughs> well, so... that's fun. <laughs> well, it's time for guess who? Who are you? I must know. He used to disappoint me. I'm going to put that quote in at some point. Let's do it. Guess who? Okay. Two for six currently. So we've got three today. Okay. And I think you might... It seems like it should be easy, but I could be wrong. Yeah. But it seems like it should be easy. Yeah. The sun and wind had changed her, too. They had taken the sparkle from her eyes and left them a sober gray. They had taken the red from her cheeks and lips, and they were gray also. She was thin and gaunt and never smiled now. Okay, well, uh, Auntie M is my initial, or, or, and this is kind of getting to my, one of my, was that in the book kind of moments, but the other, uh, the other thing I'm thinking is, um, if, if there is the parallel of the Wicked Witch before, in Kansas, potentially mm -hmm. that character, which I don't remember her name in Kansas. Miss Gulch. Miss Gulch. So I'm thinking either Auntie Amber or Miss Gulch, because the wind and the sun, being in Kansas for a long time. Right. Uh, uh, Out on the prairie. Right. Because I don't think, I think that that wouldn't be how they described, uh, I keep wanting to say Alice because I'm looking at a picture of Alice um, <laughs> on our wall. <laughs> Dorothy. I'm going to say Auntie M. Okay, is that your final yes. answer? You are correct. Boom! Yes! <laughs> one for one. Next. For they saw... Standing just there, a little old man with a bald head and a wrinkled face who seemed to be as much surprised as they were. Okay, well this feels like the wizard, but, uh, <laughs> um, little old man standing there just surprised as they were. Yeah. Uh, I'm gonna say the wizard. You're correct. No! Yes! I'm really two not two. trying to fool you. No, I know, I didn't think, like I said, I thought this would be easier, but I, I still, you never know. Okay. 
Final Last one. one. She was both beautiful and young to their eyes. Her hair was a rich red in color and fell in flowing ringlets over her shoulders. Her dress was pure white, but her eyes were blue, mm-hmm. and they looked kindly upon the little girl. Yeah, Glenda, the good witch. Yeah, it's Glenda. Yeah. All right, ah, 30 30, who? <laughs> uh, easy. <laughs> All right, so now what? Five for nine? Oh, that helped. That one helps. <laughs> Woof, got me above a pa- got me above fifty uh, percent, right? Because yeah, two for six, five for nine now. Yeah, I was really hoping that the book would have an actual description of the wicked witch. Yeah, that would be interesting. Um, because the the pictures, the illustrations are really kind of crazy. Mm-hmm. Um, she mm-hmm. has like three braids sticking out from her head and like like a super kooky outfit. Yeah. Um, but there's no actual description of her, which was disappointing. Let's move on to Was That in the Book? Was that in the book? No, that was in the book. Alright, I only have three because I had a hard time with this the one this time because I felt like I felt like most of it I was like this probably was in the book. To an extent, like mm-hmm. it, I don't know, it, it didn't seem like there was a lot, especially I don't know. We'll see. I, it is, I, but I didn't have a lot of them. But my first one, and this is what we were talking about earlier. Here's my question: Are the Oz characters mirrored in, or, or are they supposed to be reflections of the Kansas real life characters no. in the book? No, no, that's interesting. Movie only. Okay, and I was wondering, like, I, I thought that was interesting. I didn't know. I thought that might be a movie thing. Though, were they, yeah. were the Wicked Witch? There's a her, like an evil lady in the, mm-hmm. in Kansas, and then all of her uncles or whatever they are, um, the farm hands farm hands, or, yeah, and I guess yeah. No, those know. characters are not in the book at all, Miss right. Gulch or the farm hands. So that's interesting. I, I I think I like that addition. I think that's mm-hmm. that's fun, if nothing else. But I think it's a I think it's a clever and an interesting idea. And I thought that might not be in the book. I thought that <laughs> it was just sort of going to be its own little fairy tale land, and it wasn't going to tie in. Yeah. And have the same parallels that they had in the movie. Nice. God, I'm crushing it today. <laughs> <laughs> All right, this is a pretty simple one, but this is about music. Because obviously, they wrote a bunch of songs for the movie. Right. But is there any music in the book? And when I say music, what I mean is, obviously, I don't think they're, like, written out. Well, there could be, because, I mean, like, Lord of the Rings. But do they even say, like, and then the characters broke into song or anything? Like, I guess the thing, the main one I was thinking of was with the Munchkins like, do they describe any sort of... Do they have, like, a song and dance parade for her when she... You know, because, like, most of the songs, like, yeah. She, like, Somewhere Over the Rainbow, she's not... Like, that's not going to be in the book, I wouldn't think. Uh-huh. But... No. No. Okay. No. And that's kind of what I figured. And now I just was wondering if there would be any elements of... Or, or like Lord of the Rings, if there would be... Like, you know, written songs at any point or anything like that. No, there's not. It wouldn't have surprised me terribly if there had been. But, yeah, that's movie only, strictly. Like like I said, like a Disney movie, they added the songs. And I got that. I was just wondering if there was any influence from the book of uh, them describing, like, you know, the Munchkins singing or or Mm -hmm. whatever or something, you know, something like that. I just, I was wondering. So that's, that's interesting. That's, that's, that's what I thought, though, so. Last one, cooking. That's good because I got lots of stuff to talk about. This is very specific. Okay. But it's just a little thing, and I and it was made me wonder because of the whole Technicolor thing. Made me wonder if this was in the book, the horse of a different color. That changes colors. Is that in the book? Oh no. Um. Okay, because it, here's the thing. It struck me as something that could be in the book, like a fun, fantastical uh-huh. beast. Like you know, it's a horse that changes colors. But I was like. I could totally see them adding this because look at the Technicolor. Every shot, it's a different color horse. Magic. Like I, got, <laughs> I was like, this totally could just be in the movie. But I wouldn't be surprised if... Because the, like, the horse of a different color was kind of clever and that could seem like a thing mm-hmm. to me that could be in the book. But So no. No, no. no color changing horse. No. <laughs> we'll, we'll get to the Emerald City okay. in a bit. Okay, well that's it. That's all I got. That's all I have for was that in the book because I know I'm sure I missed things that weren't in the book, but mm-hmm. those were the ones that kind of stuck out to me. And like I said, a lot of it, I was like, I could see this being in the book. It just didn't seem, because it's kind of such a simple movie. Right. It didn't, you know, there's not like a bunch of added stuff that I'm like, well, I can't see what, you know, it's just. Yeah, most of the changes are, 
little things like that, and the frame story is more mm. in the movie. Oh, is it? It's long. yeah, yeah. Um, there's a there's more to it with the extra characters right. and everything, but for the most part, the movie is a pretty pared down version of the story that appears right. in the book. They right. they cut a lot of the kookier stuff that happens. Yeah. What's the, I guess this is the thing, and with this, I don't want to cut it, if there's anything that you're saving for better in the book, I don't want to cut into that, but it's like, what's the biggest thing that was added for the movie? And again, if this, this cuts into better in the movie or better in the book, don't need to, you can say, we'll talk about it later, but if there's something in particular, like, whoa, like that you're surprised I didn't think was added for the movie mm. and not in the book, I just didn't know if there was anything that stuck out to you. That you're surprised um, I didn't There ask is about. something in regards to the Wicked Witch that I want to talk about later. Okay. It was interesting. I was pretty much correct about all of those. Again, crushing yeah. it. I mean, those are pretty clear. All movie right, fine. Things. Let me have this. <laughs> Having a good week where I'm getting everything right. I need you to. Call me. Well, it's pretty obvious. All right, all right. All right. <laughs> Lost in adaptation. All right, this one, this is where I can see some discussion happening because this is more of a let's discuss writing mm-hmm. um, and theme and uh, message. So the uh, maybe I'll do it. We'll do this one last. I'll go to my other ones first. Okay. My first one we'll do last, and I'll do my other ones. Why does water melt the Wicked Witch? Do we know? Is it never addressed in the book? It just does? It just does, I think. I can double check here. Okay. Because I was wondering if there was any sort of explanation, or, you know, any more on just, because it just happens in the movie. She gets water on her, she dies. And it's like, whoa, all right. All right, all right. You know, I didn't know if there was like a, when she was a child, she... No, it's not explained. Um... It happens fairly similarly to yeah. how it does. Like she's trying to put out a fire, and, or does she actively throw she... water on her? Well, Dorothy has a little more sass in the book yeah. than she does in the movie, and she throws the water on her because she's angry. No, so it's not like witch. trying to put out no, a fire she's and not like trying accidentally to put out a fire. gets her wet. Yeah. Interesting. She's just pissed off. That's a pretty interesting change. Yeah. I think that's a that's a compelling change to the to the story. Mm-hmm. Makes uh, gives Dorothy a little more agency, <laughs> <laughs> but this is 1930s uh, America film. Right. Women can't have agency. We're uh, sandwiched between the Great Depression and the Second World War yeah. here. So, yeah. I mean, I, I say women. Uh, it, yeah. it, it, for the time, this is a fairly progressive having a female-led fairy tale. I'd say fairly progressive. I don't know, how but like, it's a could be worse. <laughs> could be, could be worse. <laughs> this one. Why does the Scarecrow want a brain? Does he want a brain in the book? I yeah, assume. he does yes. want a brain. Because, in so in the movie, he's like, the song is about how he could, like, basically just think and do things. Mm-hmm. But I, I felt like the implication is that having a brain would help him be a better scarecrow. Because he's like, man, the crows aren't scared of me. Not not a single crow, they just don't even care. And I was like, well, how does having a brain change that? Like, I felt like his, I don't know. So, is, is his explanation, why does he want a brain? I mean... Just to have one? Just to have one, basically. (laughs) But one thing that... One way that I think these differ... I think the book does a little bit of a better job addressing the themes. Yeah. And it it is a little bit on the nose. The book? Yeah, the book is. um, Because it it is is for children. But it's more emphasized, I think, in the book. Those themes of, like, self-sufficiency and believing in your own abilities and your power and your agency. Yeah. But those themes get a little more lost in the film. I think a little bit in the name of comedy. Yeah. Because, I mean, the Scarecrow is played a little clownish. In the movie? In the movie. Yeah. Not a little. A lot clownish. I mean, (laughs) that's an understatement. It's a lot clownish. Um, And in the book, there is some, like, physical comedy. Like, he's always kind of fallen down. Yeah, Um, yeah, he trips over things. But he's not dumb. Hmm. Well, and he's not 
dumb in the movie, per se. Like, and they make a good point because of illustrating the fact that all these people already have the thing they're yes. looking for is, you know, like the moment when he, at the end, with the he looks up and sees the chandelier and is like, we can use that to hit all mm-hmm. these guards. And then he's the one who shot, you know what right. I mean? So, like, they play that as he's not dumb. He, I mean, he he's kind of dumb and he's a slapstick. Yeah. He's a clown, but he's not played super dumb in the movie even. And well, I would say though that out of the three, out of those three characters, that the theme comes through with the scarecrow best out of the three of them, but it's even more so emphasized in the book. Like whenever they run up against a problem, it's always the scarecrow who has the solution. solution he yeah. has every single good idea. Yeah. But he walks around insisting that he doesn't have a brain. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Hmm. And then like the Tin Man, which it comes through a little bit in the movie where you can see that he cares about his friends. But, like, in the book, he is so tender-hearted, he can't even squish a bug. Say, so the, the Tin Man's probably the worst one mm-hmm. because having a heart's kind of vague-ish. Yeah. At least, and, and that was the one that's probably the least expressed in the movie, I thought, yeah. because the lion has the moments where he's brave in spite of right. being a coward uh, or saying he's a coward where, you know, he's the one that, when they get to the castle and they're like, you're going to, you know, and he's like, all right, you know, but I mean, like they kind of, kind of force him, but he still does it. And, mm-hmm. and so he, you know, he, he, his was kind of obvious and the brain, like I said, they have a, a very distinct moment of the scarecrow figuring out how to get them out of a situation where all the guards are coming at yeah. them. But the heart, there's not really right. quite as much of an, uh, and they don't, his backstory is not in the movie. His whole backstory. I mean, the they say man. like the tin man, like the tin maker made him. That's what they say. I don't. He said because he said that he forgot to put a heart in, in the movie. Oh, okay, right. That's what they say. He says when they when they start putting the oil on him, mm-hmm. he says something like the tin maker. I don't know what he calls him, but the tin man or the, not the tin man, <laughs> but the, the guy who made him. He says he forgot to put a heart in me or didn't mm-hmm. put a heart in me, but they don't go into any detail or any. Okay, so in the book, he has a whole backstory where he was in love with this girl. And uh, her mother didn't want them to get married, so she goes to the Wicked Witch and pays her to disrupt the relationship. And what the Wicked Witch does is enchant his axe so that when he tries to swing it, it cuts off his limbs. God. <laughs> it's it's, it's old literature. It's grotesque. It's intense. Um, so he keeps losing limbs and he keeps replacing them with... Tin so he's a normal appendages. dude. He starts as a man. Yes, he starts ah. as a man, and then he slowly becomes a tin man. And when it gets to the point where he has his torso replaced, he's like, "Well, wait a minute. I don't have a heart now. That means that I can no longer love this girl. So I had better leave oh. because I can't give her the life that she well, deserves." That's such a fascinating backstory. I know. I mean, they had no time for it in the no. movie, but it's very interesting. Because, yeah, in the movie, he's just, like, a guy made me a tin man. Like, he's just yeah. designed by, like, a tin maker. I mean, I could think of a song they could have cut to make room for that. Which one? Uh, the King of the Forest. Yes. Yes. It does nothing. That there's. N- it doesn't serve the plot at all. I went all. to the bathroom during that song. I, I don't <laughs> like that song. Yeah. I feel like that's they, the lion like, one, right? Yes, when he's, that's at, the when lion he's in the one at the Emerald when he, City. Yes, when he's yeah, warbling. I totally went to the bathroom during that. I was like, I don't. This is irrelevant. I don't. <laughs> no, it's like a five-minute song yeah. for no yeah. reason. Yeah. It doesn't further the plot at all, and yeah. we already know that that's his motivation. We already know everything we need to know about yeah. the cowardly lion. He's called the cowardly lion. Like we don't. It's... When I was reading this book about a chapter after meeting the Cowardly Lion, I realized that I was picturing a man in a lion suit. A man in a giant carpet it. bag? Yeah, instead of an actual lion. An actual lion, yeah. <laughs> less, less Aslan, more <laughs> giant, a guy in a giant <laughs> carpet Oof. rug with jowls. Yeah. Yeah. All right, well, that's fascinating. I'm really glad we got into that because I that back, Tin Man backstory is really cool. Yeah, they all have a little bit more of a backstory. Scarecrow's backstory is um, the story of how he gained consciousness as the farmer was building him. (laughs) Why is this shit so intense? (laughs) 
This is ridiculous. You know this, this old children's book? You know this old children's literature is always dark. I know, I know. This is my last one, and this, I think, could spawn a significant amount of discussion. Okay. It's about Dorothy. So the message. Her, the whole message for her, her, her theme is that uh, she runs away in the movie. She runs away from home. Mm-hmm. And they play it as she's doing something self-centered and not thinking about her family and that mm-hmm. home is there's no place like home obviously and like it's a bad thing that, and she's learning a lesson that running away from home isn't the answer and that sort of thing like it's kind of how they play it in the movie like mm-hmm. and that you know so by the end she learns that oh i really all i ever really needed at home was or uh, all i ever really needed was just to be at home and with my family and that sort of thing and this message doesn't make a lot of sense to me in the movie because the reason she runs away isn't like a I'm mad like there's never a moment where she's mad at Auntie M or right. or there's some sort of conflict at home or or you know like the traditional I'm running away from home because I hate my parents right which is like how they play the message yeah but the reason she runs away from home in the movie is because a woman is going to murder her dog <laughs> And so she's like, we got to get my dog not there to be murdered. Yeah. And then they, but they, like, you know what I mean? Right. Like, it's a very strange, like, she doesn't run away for, like, greedy. Right. she's self- not running away for a petty childish no, reason. No, it's not a petty, ch- exactly. It's not a petty childish reason, reason, which is normally what that kind of story Right. When the child runs away. And then they learn the lesson of, oh, I was being petty. I, you know, mm-hmm. they learn that. Uh, their parents you know this is like this fucking evil woman is gonna kill my dog and i don't want my dog to die so i i took my dog and and left okay yeah you know what yeah. i mean and so i was i, I was sitting there thinking about it. i was like this is interesting that and then like she shows up and she meets the wizard in the real world and uh, the who's yeah. he, and he's a fortune teller or whatever yeah. and he's telling her he's like showing oh your aunt's so sad and blah 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 and like guilt tripping her and i'm like <laughs> But she didn't, again, she didn't run away because, like, her her aunt, like... Right, it's not like she threw a tantrum. Yeah, and... yeah. It was a weird, it was weird to me. I was like, this isn't, makes sense. This doesn't add up, like... Well, it, it, and it's interesting that it doesn't add up and it doesn't make sense because all of that was added yeah. for the movie. Yeah. Dorothy in the book doesn't really have an arc so to speak. Yeah. She's more of, like, an everyman character or, like, an audience POV character. Right. She doesn't end up in Oz because she ran away. She just didn't make it into the cellar in time. Well, and that's getting back to the tornado, which makes it even weirder. So, the the story is, you know, you think the thing would be she runs away from home. Here's how it should have been. She sets up. She runs away from home (laughs) for whatever reason. And then he gets sucked to Oz or whatever. And then in Oz learns, mm-hmm. there's no place like home. I should love my family and blah, right. whatever. She learns she has that whole character arc before the movie even starts. Yeah. She runs away from home. She feels guilty and bad about it. She goes back home. <laughs> and it's like, okay, I came back home. And then the tornado hits. And she can't get into the cellar. And so then she, that's when she goes to... like. She does the whole character arc of learning from her mistake. It's not mm-hmm. really a mistake, but like learning the, her, her from the running away from home before she ever hits the fantasy where she would learn that. Yeah, you know what I mean. It's very strange to me. And I almost wonder if they t- like we're gonna try to give her an arc, and then they realized maybe this isn't gonna work. Because we'd have to rewrite her whole story yeah. while she's in Oz. Yeah. So they tried to, like, wrap it up real quick and just, like, pull it the sum of the theme through by having her repeat there's no place like home all the time. Well, here, let me rewrite Wizard of Oz, <laughs> if I will, to make it a much better film. <laughs> Not much better, but here's all they needed to do. And I'll retrospect it fucking 100 years of film and storytelling for me to come to this conclusion but all i could have done is have her aunt be a little less in her corner Mm -hmm. in terms of the whole dog thing Mm -hmm. and be a little more complacent with uh whatever the uh, miss gulch Gulch, yeah taking her dog Mm -hmm. and and play that relationship a little more complicated so that she's actually mad while she's mad at miss gulch she's also mad at her aunt. right 
So she runs away from home. The same thing happens. She talks to the fortune teller. He guilt trips her, or whatever, Mm -hmm. like he did. But she doesn't go back home. She's still, like, no, you know, like, she's still stamping her foot, throwing her tantrum a little bit about her aunt. And gets caught in the tornado while away from home. Mm Mm-hmm. And, and or gets hit by you know whatever, goes to Oz, comes back, realizing, and she's still, you know, a mile from home, and then goes home. Yeah, that makes that whole thing make sense. I just wrote a better Wizard of Oz movie. You're welcome, MGM in 1930. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying. I was literally this time watching it I was like that none of that makes sense that that story yeah, arc, it's it's not a good not a good it's not a strongly written arc at no, all no no and further complicated by the fact that they made the witch of the north and the witch of the south into one character Glinda Glinda for the movie so there's a good north witch a right. good south witch and evil so west Glinda and evil. is the good witch of the south in the book and at the beginning, she meets the Witch of the North, who, I guess, doesn't know that the Slippers can take her home, who sends her off to the wizard. And then, at the end of the book, after she misses her shot to go on the hot air balloon, she goes to see Glinda, the Good Witch of the South, who's like, oh, by the way, here's how the shoes work. They can take you home. Yes. Right. That makes sense. One thing I did know, and the reason I didn't put it in was that in the book, because I had heard this before, is that... In the book, they're not red. Yes. Because they did that for, literally, for the Technicolor. Right, for the Technicolor. Yeah. Um, right. And I have they're just that like, in Are they just like crystal well. slippers or something? Um, or they're silver. Are, silver, yeah. Silver slippers. Yeah. They could have done a better job with that frame story, in my opinion, mm-hmm. but what do I know? <laughs> I didn't make the most successful, biggest, <laughs> iconic film of all time yet, so. <laughs> Let's <laughs> move on the to spirit, babe. Better in the Book. <laughs> So I have an overall reason that I liked the book better, and a couple smaller things. Um, oh, you just spoiled it. I'm sorry. I have to edit that out. <laughs> um, so I have an overall thing that I want to talk about that was better in the book, right. and a couple smaller things. We've touched on this. This book is so weird. Yeah. And it's just so wonderful. I'll say, um, I, there are numerous times when you're reading it where you like literally giggled out loud to yourself. Yeah. And so I was like, yeah. It, it's really strange. Yeah. You know, people will often cite Alice in Wonderland as being so much stranger than a film adaptation can capture. This is the same way. Oh, really? It's so freaking weird. To me, it's just really a shame that a lot of that weirdness got lost in favor of, like, musical numbers. As much as I yeah. like musicals, yeah. what you see on the screen is really not a good depiction of what Oz is. Because Oz is batshit bananas. Yeah. It's crazy. A couple things in the book. When the house gets carried away by the twister, and it's flying around in the air, in the movie, she hits her head on something and gets knocked out. In the book, the the window in the movie, the window right, flies. The in window and smashes flies in, her in the head. Smashes her in the head. Yeah. Um, in the book, she's up in the house, flying around in the air in the middle of a tornado, and she lays down to take a nap. What? <laughs> what? A true what? midwestern badass bitch, right? She just oh, I'm flying around in a tornado. Oh, I think it. I'll take a oh. nap. Is it Tuesday again? <laughs> <laughs> That's ridiculous. Just another day in Tornado Alley. Yeah, just another day in Kansas. <laughs> oh, that's fucking stupid. <laughs> she's like, well, it'll land eventually. Until then, it's like when you got you know going on like a an overseas flight. You're like, all right, I'm just gonna sleep this one out, take a couple Dramamine, <laughs> crash or not Dramamine, whatever, sleeping pills, <laughs> and then fall asleep. That's that's awesome. <laughs> also, wait, that was like, better in the book. Yeah. <laughs> It's not better. It makes that's, way... No, that's it's, better. It's funnier. It n- makes way more sense to have, be in a hurt or in a tornado and be struck by a thing and knocked unconscious and knocked into a dream world than to fall asleep in the middle of a tornado. <laughs> I mean, 
I get why you like it, and I also think it's fun. I would argue that it's better. Okay, well, <laughs> that actually brings me to right. another thing that I liked better about the book. Okay. Um, the book doesn't end with Dorothy waking up from a dream. Oh. That's not a thing. Um, it's never really in doubt that she actually, she actually went, went to Oz. Oz. And I personally hate abhor the it was all a dream ending i think it's lazy yeah i don't yeah i don't disagree now i think back then it was a little less probably yeah cliche yeah and that's stupid. fair you know what i mean that's fair but she doesn't wake up from a dream at the end oh no and no, that's cool i'm, I'm down the for that. silver slippers carry her home and so is their goes... home just gone I, th- I think so. <laughs> I was like, if their home <laughs> flew away and then I she mean, comes back by herself, the home is gone. Not uncommon in a, for a no, tornado. No, it's true. It did get hit by a can, fucking yeah. tornado. So, yeah. I mean, we've sense. seen aftermath from tornadoes. Yeah. You just pick up a house and take it yeah. away. No, it was, yeah. No, it makes sense. I was, I was just wondering. In the book, when you arrive at the Emerald City, the wizard, well, the gatekeeper or whatever, by decree from the wizard. Who in the movie is also the wizard. He plays, right. like, all the characters because that's the <laughs> the, the gag. Yeah. Is, yeah. They make everyone put on glasses before you can go into the Emerald City, which is what Are makes they rose everything colored? appear green. They're oh. green. So that's why everything looks green. A little, in the a little bit of a... I'm assuming rose-colored glasses was a saying at that point? Um, I don't know. I can look it up. Because I could see, you know what I mean, like that being like a... It's the the whole behind the curtain. It's you got to right. put on these glasses that right. make the city green um, because it's not actually green, but we're... Yeah, it, it's one of the ways and... in the book that the wizard is revealed to the reader as a charlatan yeah. before he's actually right. revealed. Right, yeah. Got to put on these glasses. Yeah. Look how magical this place is. Yeah. Yeah. And they tell him that if they if you don't wear the glasses, you'll be like blinded by right. the brilliance right. of the Emerald City. Right. See, that's the political satire <laughs> that I'm talking about yeah. that I could feel in the movie a little bit, not as much, but you could feel it still. Right, but that's not present in the movie. They don't make him put on glasses. Everybody just wears green right. yeah. in the Emerald City. Yeah. One other scene that's in the book that did not make it into the movie that made me go, holy shit. There is a scene when they are on their way to the castle of the Wicked Witch where the Tin Man takes his axe and mows down 40 wolves, followed immediately by a scene where the Scarecrow strangles 40 crows with his bare hands. (laughs) (laughs) And I'm not necessarily saying it's better, but it's more interesting. Interesting. (laughs) I just, I just imagine a. <laughs> they could either do it one of two ways. I imagine a montage in the movie of just axe swing, dead wolf, axe swing, dead wolf, cutting to the scarecrow, just strangling birds, just with that same goofy look on his face, and he's like falling over, like woo, woo, choking birds to death. That's a whole different movie that I wouldn't hate seeing. <laughs> Dark Oz. Yes. Well, they're Return to Oz, which oh, we may God. have to do one day. Well, I don't know if it's really Return, based on the book, Return though. to Oz is actually kind of an amalgamation of two different Well, Oz that could books. be fun, because Return yeah. to Oz is fucking bonkers, apparently. I've never <laughs> seen it. To, I've seen it. Return to Oz is terrifying. That's what I mean. Like, it's crazy yeah. when you said Dark Oz. Like, that's what yeah. I heard. Like, Return to Oz is <laughs> if like... If you've never seen Return to Oz, don't watch it at night. Or do. <laughs> it's creepy. Watch it at night on drugs. <laughs> Better in the movie. Okay. Judy Garland. That's what's better in the movie. Sorry. Yeah, Judy Garland. Younger than she looks. Yeah. Sort of. When at the time of filming. Yeah, like yeah. She's 16. 15 and her, yeah, 16. Yeah. And she looks, you know, 
late teens. Yeah. 19, maybe 18. early 20s. Yeah. Maybe. But you can see it in the face. We, talk, yeah, we were talking about yeah. it while we were watching it. You can see she, she's, she's a mixture of... Mm-hmm. You, you can see that she's young, but she also, to our eyes, to our modern day eyes, looks a little right. older. Right, she's, um, you know, the the styling is yeah. what we would associate with an older person. She also apparently had to wear, like, a chest binder to be in this movie. Mm-hmm. She was too developed to yeah. look like a young girl. Oh, well, she's... From what I understand of Judy Garland, she went through some fucking shit. Yeah. Like, her life was kind of a nightmare. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, we don't even get into it, but yeah. <laughs> but Dorothy in the book is... A kid, kid. A kid, like yeah. like twelve or something, or even younger. younger. Like, yeah, yeah. I would, I would put her at like eight, eight or maybe. Nine. Okay. Yeah. yeah, interesting. So, you, do you are you saying you like? Well, I I said Judy Garland, but is that you think it's more interesting if she's a little older? Or? Um, I I, I don't. I yeah, I think it works either way, and I they don't really play her as. I mean, I don't really think there's anything definitive to mark her as. Oh, she's a teenager. No, 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 they just she's they 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 wanted a kid, but they needed a kid, mm-hmm. but they didn't want a child actor, yes. so they got a fifteen, sixteen right. year old, and, and this is one of the things somebody she, with the pipes, right? Yeah, and somebody who could sing. She, uh, she was. I, I guess they at this back then they didn't do if you were under a certain age, you could not be nominated for best actress or actor. Right. I guess because she won an award for best juvenile. Hmm. Actress or something like it was like a it was but it was like a recognition it wasn't mm-hmm. like an actual Oscar it, but it was like they like recognized her for because she was in like two movies in mm-hmm. 1939 one of them being Wizard of Oz but so I guess they used to have like an age limit because now like it doesn't like they're like right. that one little girl won Best Supporting or something like, yeah, yeah 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 like I guess it doesn't matter anymore but they used to have separate like just hmm. recognition for kids I guess what else is better in the movie anything else so. I understand why most of the story got cut. Yeah. Like, I, I get it. Um, the movie turns it into something that's very succinct, even easier to follow than the book is. Yeah. Um, and I get that even though, by and large, I find the book more interesting. But there is a lot of stuff. There's a scene with, like, the queen of the field mice. There's somebody, There's a group of people with hammerheads. There's a porcelain village that aren't missed by the narrative. Yeah, just some yeah. extra stuff. So as far as the medium of film goes, I get it. You're um, saying they cut the Tom Bombadil of... Or, or... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we had an argument last night about how pivotal and important and interesting Tom Bombadil is, and we'll have to discuss that once we finally get to the Lord of the Rings films. Oh, Tolkien but... couldn't kill his darlings. <sighs> I don't necessarily disagree, but... I still like Tom Bombadil. Anyways. <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> okay. So we kind of touched on this, but the book doesn't have a central villain. There's no Miss Gulch. The, and the Wicked Witch of the West doesn't antagonize them In throughout the, the story. She doesn't appear at the beginning. So she's basically take... just got to go get her broom. And yeah, then, yeah. They don't meet her until the very end of the book. And I think that works in book format because it's really more about the journey Right. than anything else right. but, but in a film, for a movie yeah you need a central villain yeah. and margaret hamilton gave us a good one which i have a fun interesting fact about her she's kind of a it was a saruman situation is what i'll call it <laughs> i like the look do on elaborate so you people are aware how in lord of the rings uh christopher lee who plays saruman gigantic lord of the rings fan mm. loved them read them every year like since they came out I think was even friends with J.R.R. Tolkien for a while before he died. Maybe I can, I could be mm. wrong about that. I, I that might be making that up, but I thought he like had talked to J.R.R. Mm-hmm. Tolkien. That wouldn't surprise me. So he's he was a huge Lord of the Rings fan, and he but he auditioned. He wanted in when they were making Lord of the Rings movies, he was like I gotta fucking be in these movies, mm-hmm. and he wanted to be Gandalf. Mm-hmm. He auditioned for Gandalf, and but they were like mm, we got somebody else for Gandalf, Sir Ian oh. McKellen. Sir Ian McKellen. I don't think you're Sir Christopher Lee. Maybe he is. I don't know. I don't think he's knighted. Anyways. He might be. I I don't want to. Un, I don't want to <laughs> cast aspersions yeah. at his uh, title if he is knighted. Um, he's fucking killed people. So, <laughs> anyways, but so they're like, you can be Saruman. We want you to be Saruman. You'll be great as Saruman, uh-huh. and he was great as Saruman. Yeah, he was. So she, uh, Margaret Hamilton. Hamilton, huge fan of the Oz books, mm-hmm. gigantic fan of the Oz books. And when she found out they were making the thing, she was like, I want to be in these movies. And they were like, Cool. And they're like, Hey, we want you to be in the movie. And then so she was talking to her agent or somebody, and they were mm-hmm. and they were like. She was like, well, what role do they want me as? 
or what do they want me to do? And they were like, well, obviously you're going to be the Wicked Witch of the West. <laughs> and she was oh. like, all right. <laughs> this is how it read on Wikipedia, at least. They were like, you're going to be the Wicked Witch of the West. And she was well, like, well, clearly. All right. <laughs> I'm down. So, but yeah, so she was a giant fan of yeah. the books oh, and, right. uh. She was really wanted to be in the movies and was able to be in the movies. And did it with Vim and No, Vim. Yeah, no. She crushed it. Her scene, and I have a note about that, her scene the when she dies. I love that scene. is. <laughs> the, I love the line, what a world. Is that in the book? Do you remember? Like, no, it's not in the what book. What a world. What a world. And it's just like, what a line for when you're dying. <laughs> like, just, what a world. What world do we live in? Like, it's so epic. <laughs> like, Yeah. Um, but that scene's kind of horrifying because they yeah. play it real straight and it just sits on that shot and she just slowly and quietly yeah <laughs> dies sinks down <laughs> yeah and like <laughs> gets quieter and quieter and they're all just kind of standing there and then she's gone and they're like hooray and I'm like that was horrible <laughs> but anyway so yeah okay uh, so to Bring it back around. We talked about this a little earlier to one of the most oft cited differences between the book and the movie, the ruby slippers. Yes. The movie makes them ruby to show off that fancy technicolor. Mm -hmm. um, in the book, they are silver. And I think changing them for the movie was a good idea. Yeah. I don't think that silver slippers would have become as iconic no, not even close. as the ruby slippers did. Well, and they had to di differentiate them because, I mean, while the crystal, um, uh, well, I guess Cinderella wasn't out. Cinderella come out after this. Um, Disney Cinderella, that was 1950. Right, but I mean, still the story of Cinderella with the glass right, slipper. Yeah. Silver glass, I mean, there it's a, li it's yeah, a little wanna, muddy. You like You want something different yeah. that's, that's a little more iconic. So right. I, even apart from the that's technicolor. It's not going to be in the same color family. Yeah, and yeah. And kind of, and, and with, with Dorothy's outfit, I mean, she wears that blue and white mm -hmm. um, calico or whatever dress mm -hmm. and silver in that, and, and against her pale white skin, it just yeah. kind of all gets lost. Whereas yeah. bright red slippers, you can see them from a mile away. And and silver wouldn't have been nearly as striking. I keep saying slippers, shoes, but yeah. Oh, that's they call them slippers. They call them slippers, though, yeah. Ruby slippers. Ruby slippers, but oh, and they're they really them, just they like heeled. Slippers, they're heeled shoes. So, yeah. <laughs> like, they have heels and everything. Anyways. Yeah. No, they don't strike me as slippers. To me, slippers are fuzzy and you wear them like, around well, the house. Well, you don't know anything about slippers. I guess not. One thing I do want to talk about, some fun facts. When I said earlier that I was looking up a, a popular political theory mm, about the Wizard of Oz. Let's get political. Um, so the Silver Slippers and the Yellow Brick Road. Oz was published in 1900. And around that time... There was French, a pretty big anymore. populist movement oh. to get rid of the gold standard and monetize silver. So the theory goes that the yellow brick road What's symbolizes the gold standard, the gold standard and oh. the silver slippers are silver, obviously. Right. Um, and the yellow brick road ends up leading Dorothy to, to a con man who can't actually help her, and is not... while the slippers are what allows her to achieve her goals. Right. Um, That's <laughs> hilarious. It's it's one of the most popular theories about the book. It's not universally accepted. That's hilarious. But though. it's one of the most popular. Ones. That's so fascinating. And I that might have meant a lot to an audience in 1900. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if it would have had the same meaning to an audience in 1939. Yeah, I don't know. I Probably mean. Not. I looked it up, and we officially abandoned the gold standard in 1933. So, I mean, maybe that would have come through had they. Kept I wonder it if, silver, like, but... Glenn Beck and Fox News and Republican, like, are all really not Republicans, but like that, like, right wing Glenn Beck, because mm -hmm. they they're in love with the gold standard. Like, they sell yeah. gold like crazy. Like, if you ever watch Fox News, like, all the commercials are basically for like hearing aids and like gold <laughs> and like adult diapers, basically. <laughs> For the most part, I mean, I don't watch a lot of Fox News for reasons, but but they, they have a lot of gold commercials because mm -hmm. they're in love with the gold standard because the, there's the whole idea that the American currency isn't backed right, by the gold standard. Right. It's, not, it's fiat currency and blah, 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 et cetera. So I wonder if they like really hate the, because this was like propaganda <laughs> pushing against the gold yeah. standard if like Glenn Beck hates this movie. I hope he does. 
I hope he hates it. Well, I mean, the movie doesn't have that symbolism. Oh, right, because the red yeah. slippers. So, he... so they're, they're trying to push a ruby stamp. <laughs> <laughs> trying, trying to just a ruby. trade rubies. Or blood. <laughs> Maybe it's all a globalist conspiracy to push blood as the new currency standard. I can see that. Oh, Illuminati, wake getting, up, sheeple. Getting in the dystopia territory <laughs> wake here. Wake up, sheeple. <laughs> <laughs> the new world government trying to push blood as the currency. Oh, can we talk about the fact that the scarecrow has a gun? Yes! Oh my god, okay, yes. I never noticed never that. Never noticed this. We were sitting there and we were watching this earlier and we're like, the scarecrow's got a, is that a fucking gun? The scarecrow has a revolver. He yeah. has a revolver. When they're, when they're going in to, to sneak the, into the Witch Gate, which yeah, is when they're in the haunted forest. Yeah. He's got because like the, the 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 cowardly lion has like a, a net and like yeah. a like a like a big butterfly net and like a like a poison thing like yeah. a, like one of those things from like old cartoons where they like push it and it shoots poison out or whatever uh, or like you know like yeah like a bug killer thing yeah. or whatever and uh, I don't remember what I mean, the Tin Man has his axe just has his axe assume. and yeah and then but yeah <laughs> Scarecrow's a, a revolver. <laughs> Just walking around with a revolver. I'm like, he wins? <laughs> like, he's fighting a bunch of, like, green dudes with halberds. Like, he's got a gun. Where do they get a gun? This is weird. <laughs> like, it was very strange. I guess he drops it in the forest, and yeah. like, when the monkeys attack, yeah. and they don't really ever see it. You know what would be a great scene? <laughs> they need to add this in. Maybe it's a deleted scene. This would be the best deleted scene ever. When the monkeys attack, there's a scene where... <laughs> The scarecrow pulls out his revolver and like shoots like six of the monkeys dead and then runs out of ammo and is like trying to reload and then drops it and but he's just like rah, 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 kills like six of the monkeys. I could replace the scene where he strangles all the birds. Yeah, no, we need them both. We need them both. We need them strangling birds in the first half of the movie, shooting monkeys dead with a or flying monkeys dead with a revolver in the last half of the movie. The scarecrow basically could have been like the Arnold Schwarzenegger, like the action he hero of been. this movie. That's a remake I want to see. It's the <laughs> Scarecrow as an 80s action star. <laughs> it, it does seem so anachronistic. Yeah, it's just so it's, weird. Yeah. It's just like, a gun? Really? All right. Fine. Sure. <laughs> Why not? Might as well just give him like a super soaker. Like, what is... <laughs> like, that's what they needed. If they had super soakers, they could have wiped this shit out. Like... Yeah. Really quick. That would be a fun, another fun story. Like, you know, they show up with super Yeah, that would be a fun parody. Yeah. Or a squirt gun. Yeah. Maybe that's what it was. Maybe it wasn't a revolver. It looked pretty chintzy. <laughs> Maybe it was a, like, a, a little squirt, a squirt gun, gun that looked like a revolver. <laughs> and they gave it, and the wizard gave it to him because he knew the water thing. And he was like, yeah. here, take this. And then the, he lost it because he didn't have a brain. <laughs> All right. Let's move on to the final verdict. <laughs> So, Katie, is The Wizard of Oz better as a book or better as the 1939 film? There's a couple other op- mm. variations, but the quintessential yes. Wizard of Oz film. Which one's better? I know the movie is beloved. It's a timeless classic. Uh-huh. I prefer the book. Wow. Yeah. That doesn't surprise me. Um, and, the, you know, they're both good stories, and they both have merits upon merits, so it is, it's kind of a personal taste yeah. sort of a thing. I just, I like how weird it is. Yeah. And I, I like all of the extra stuff. The, the, the lore. Book. Yeah, the lore. Yeah. I can see that. I mean, you're a huge uh, Alice in Wonderland fan, so you're a big, yeah. big fan of the weird. You go wild for the weird. So <laughs> that totally makes sense, <laughs> that, that, that added... Strangeness. Strangeness and um, flavor. And why? Well, because it's it's the movie's very, like you said, it's pared down. It's yeah, it is very it's much the so. main story. It's there's not as much as there's a lot of beautiful art, it, yeah, it, art it direction is. and that sort of thing. The world's not super lived in. It's not like yeah. a Lord of the Rings. Well, obviously, because it's you know it's a, it's an old film, but like it's not like a Lord of the Rings film where you get with Lord of the Rings and we'll we'll get to it, but. You feel a lot of that lore that's in the books, mm-hmm. while not a, a directly expressed in the films. Mm-hmm. You feel it through the setting and the art direction, <laughs> and the secondary characters and the minor interactions with other characters in the world. And when they stop places, you feel all of that weight, all of mm-hmm. that backstory that isn't expressed, or you don't really get that 
in the movie in this movie yeah. as much. Yeah, like you said, the world doesn't really feel lived in. No. You don't really get well like, if, some of the the backstory, the history. Yeah. It feels like it was filmed on a bunch of sound stages because yeah. it was. Yeah. <laughs> so, like, yeah, yeah. chalk another one up to the books. Two to two now, right? Yes. Yes, two to two, pretty even. It's gonna start leaning I one way, I think, think eventually. Yeah, but we've eventually. so far we've been good about keeping it, <laughs> <laughs> keeping it uh, fair. But uh, yeah, so that's uh, yeah. No, it's, that's that's kind of what I figured the uh, the direction it would go. But it's still a it's a great movie. And if you yeah. haven't seen it, who are you? Why, what are you? And you know what? If you haven't read the book, I yeah, it's a really enjoyable read and quick. Like you said, mm-hmm. you read it in a, two days. Yeah, like, like you could have read it in a sitting, probably. Or, yeah, or, if I had day. if I'd had the time to devote to it, I could have read it in one sitting. Yeah, but yeah, you read it over literally like two days. So yeah. go check out yeah. the wonderful Wizard of Oz yeah, by read it to your kids. L. Frank Baum. Just leave out the part about. Uh, fiat currency and the gold standard (laughs) they they don't care about that stuff (laughs) they're kids (laughs) all right that's gonna do it for this episode but before we go want to ask you guys to go check out our facebook page go to facebook.com slash this film is lit we post uh, stories there. We just posted with our last episode, Arrival, or no, not all right, two episodes ago, uh, Percy Jackson. We posted uh, an article uh, from the author stating mm. that people, please stop showing the movie <laughs> version of my books in your like uh, Greek history or in your history classes or oh, literature what classes. A world. <laughs> yeah. So we post fun stuff like that. So you can follow us on Facebook. Also, eventually, we're going to start getting recommendations from you guys, sharing what our list of movies we're going to be doing is, and getting your input so we can kind of rearrange and see what you guys want us to talk about, that sort of thing. Also, if you can go uh, on iTunes, leave us a five-star review. We actually have five reviews now. All those reviews on iTunes and on Stitcher, if you can go on there and do the same thing, help a lot. They help us, our, our the podcast, get recommended more and shared up, and eventually, maybe, we'll show up in that new and trending page probably not it would take a lot of listeners but who knows maybe one day thank you to everyone who's already left us reviews yes it's been fantastic and And yes thank you to everyone who does in the future yes and we and we already have uh, over 200 subscribers which is fantastic we're only a few episodes in and we already have a pretty big audience and it's growing which is super exciting we're loving it having a lot of fun doing the show uh we also have a twitter now uh that we just started uh it's twitter.com com slash or just at, at, at this, this film, film is, lit. is yeah. lit at this film is lit i don't know how the twi- twitters work uh <laughs> <laughs> even though i run the social media for <laughs> for a good bad or bad bad i still know how the tweets work. i still don't know how that shit works uh also if you're listening to this and you don't know what good bad or bad bad is <laughs> which i feel like most of the people listening to this probably <laughs> come from that audience but if not if you're listening to this from some other means i host a show on youtube called good bad or bad bad where me and my friend kyle watch and review bad movies the if you like movies. the worst movies if you like uh red letter media's best of the worst or uh, mystery science theater or stuff like that it's a similar type of thing we talk about bad movies edit in clips from the movie it's pretty fun so you can go to youtube.com slash good better bad bad check out our channel for that our next film slash book is going to be just in time for blade runner 2049 we will be talking about Blade Runner, the original, the original Blade, Blade, Runner, Blade Runner, slash Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? Yes, which I have never read. Uh, I've seen Blade Runner a handful of times. I own it on Blu-ray. Uh, it's a f- fantastic sci-fi film. Um, but I'm interested to see your take. Yeah. Because it's not an easy sci It's not, I don't want to say easy. It's uh, unlike Arrival's a very good, uh, heady sci-fi film, but it's... Uh, pretty accessible. I don't want to say completely mm-hmm. accessible. It's not, you know, they're they're more accessible, easy to view sci-fi films than Arrival. But even compared to something like Arrival, Blade Runner can be kind of tough. It's a little trudging. It's a little slow. It can be an interesting. It can be interesting. Uh, so I'm interested to see your yeah. take on it. I, I'm I'm interested too because up until this point, um, we've been doing stuff where I'm a little more familiar with yeah. the movie. Yeah. And or the book. Yeah. Like, um, all of them so far, you've seen the movie once before. Yeah. Yeah. This will be your first time watching the movie right. for the first I've time. I've never seen Blade Runner and, and I've never read, never read yeah. Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep. So this Sheep. is so, breaking new ground here. Yes. <laughs> it is very interesting. Yeah. 
I'm sure I'll have opinions. Yeah, no, it's fascinating. So that's our next episode in two weeks. Blade Runner slash Do Androids Dream Electric Sheep? Be a nice little preface before you head out and see Blade Runner 2049, directed by Denny Villeneuve, who did Arrival. Look at Excellent. Those. It's, all, it's like we have this planned out or something. <laughs> it's like we thought a little bit about any of this, which is, we did. So, until next time, guys, keep watching movies, keep reading books. That's it. <laughs> Read the books first. Yeah, do that, I guess, but you don't you really don't have to. <laughs> You can also follow us on Goodreads, where we are keeping a running tally of whether the book was better or the movie was better. Thank you for once again listening to This Film is Lit.